Hey, good morning. We'll be starting. Please open your Bibles, may it be physical or your wonderful gadgets, and turn with me and read Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 to 46. Well, this passage is about Jesus and his prayer in Gethsemane. But I would like to focus on the disciples, and so I will truncate some of the words on this passage. Matthew 26, start with verse 36, reading in the English Standard Version. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful. Even to death, remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed. So Jesus prayed. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed. So Jesus prayed the second time. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed in the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Jesus must have been terribly disappointed to see his disciples, unable to keep up with him, to be on guard, to keep watch. But instead, they slept. Even after Jesus rebuked them for not keeping watch, yet they slept again. A few verses back, and just a moment ago, these disciples proclaimed that they are willing to die and would not deny Jesus. This is in verse 35. But note what Jesus said. Verse 41. Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus was exhorting Peter, James, and John to seek divine help for their inability for their weaknesses. And this speaks to us also that we believers must have vigilance to anticipate temptations and to be able to resist it with God's help. It only shows that our own best efforts is futile against the adversary, and we need help. The Apostle Paul knows this too well when he, in Romans chapter 7, verses 15 to 23, said, For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what what I do not want, I agree with the law that is good. So now it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me. That is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members." Paul knows that he is weak, unable to have complete control of himself, that he, does not, that he does the things that he does not want to do. It is like us knowing the truth, and yet we do the opposite. 
But continuing on with verses 24 to 25, Paul said, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Keep watching and praying. Our true and only source of victory in this battle is our Lord Jesus. So we run to Him and let Him handle the situation. The spiritual challenges is there. It is very real and very difficult, yet easily overcome with our Lord's help. And this is our confidence. Keep watching and praying. Let us pray. Oh Lord, help us to be reminded that we stay vigilant in our spiritual life. For the adversary, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Yet through you, we will be able to resist and overcome. And like the Apostle Paul, we proclaim with thankfulness to God that through our Lord Jesus, we are and will be delivered from this body of death. Thank you. Let's all rise and let's sing praises to our God.
7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. and praying, O oh Father, that we do not enter into temptation. For we know, O oh God, you will not leave us nor forsake us. You will lead us all the way until we meet you. We praise you and honor you. We thank you for your grace. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning. I think it's all right for you to greet the brother or sister beside you. Good morning. If you've joined us here for the first time, 
uh, if you've joined us for worship here at High Rock Christian Church for the first time, we'd like to welcome you. Uh, and if you're here for the first time, we'd like to ask you to please stand. Kung ito po yung una yung pagkakato na sumama sa amin sa panahon ng pagsama, please stand. Thank you for joining us. Meron pa po ba? We have a brief orientation for you. Um, Brother BJ, he's raising his hand at the back, will give you a brief orientation regarding our church. We would like to get to know you a little bit more, and we'd like to be able to let you know how, uh, how perhaps we can serve you. Your seats will be reserved to you while received, reserved for you while you're at the conference room. Let's also pray for the children. Please join me in praying for the children as they head off to Sunday school. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the wonderful ministry that you've given us. And we thank you that uh, your son, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, uh, said that the kingdom, your kingdom, is open to such children. And so we pray that as they sit under the teaching of your word, as the, as the gospel is presented to them, you might stir up in their hearts faith and new life. And may we see from, those, from these children, Lord, in the years to come, those who will not only come to saving faith, who will join the membership of the church, but those who will serve, perhaps uh, as leaders here, perhaps as missionaries to the nations. We want you to be honored and glorified through this ministry. Give our teachers joy. Cause them to stand in awe of your truth and the privilege of serving by teaching these children in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning again. What would you say is the most dangerous threat we face as Christians? A faithful minister laboring under much hardship and opposition perceived a dangerous threat to the church, to his brethren. He wrote the following in Hebrews 3 verse 12. See to it, brothers, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. This faithful minister identifies the danger of unbelief. The danger of unbelief. Brothers and sisters, unbelief is characteristic of those who fall away or apostatize. People fall away because their hearts have been filled with unbelief. How have you been tempted to be unbelieving? Perhaps in the two years, the past two years, there have been some doubts. Perhaps in some ways, your heart has been turned away from trusting God. The words related to the original language word for faith were faithful, believing, belief, unbelief, and unbelieving. And they are all over this letter to the Hebrews. There are 41 of those faith words in the whole letter. And I'm sure that you're familiar with uh, Hebrews chapter 11, where the author narrates the examples of those who lived by faith. And that is important to his exhortation in the letter. He was encouraging believers to be faithful. He was encouraging them to endure with faithfulness. And the author instructed these brethren to pay careful attention to their hearts because unbelief leading to apostasy is real. Teachings, warnings, instructions, exhortations, like the letter to the Hebrews, are necessary because Christians must be made aware of the danger and they must be taught to guard their hearts. What does he tell them to do to make sure that unbelief would not overcome any of them? How did he want the brethren to guard against evil, unbelieving hearts and ultimately falling away? 
Hebrews 3.13 reads, But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Observe that he instructs them towards mutual encouragement. Isn't that wonderful? You see, the author himself models this by writing this letter to his brothers, to his brethren. And he expresses his concern that evil would be found in any of them. And then he directs them to encourage one another, to exhort one another, to comfort one another, to stir up one another's hearts to faith. Brothers and sisters, how have you needed encouragement, counsel, comfort, and exhortation? Have you needed to hear it from brethren? Do brethren need encouragement from you? This is so important to the biblical author that he also directs them with a frequency, saying day after day. Why do you think this kind of encouragement is necessary? Well, how often is your faith, how often is my faith tested? So while we have opportunity, let us come alongside one another. Let's listen to one another. Let's pray for one another. Let's encourage one another. And I want you to note that this is not just some sentimental thing for the inspired writer, but it is a powerful spiritual principle. It's a principle of how the church works, what the church is to be. He teaches that this daily encouragement between brethren is to prevent us from being hardened by sin's deception. So we need to lovingly speak to one another, to speak to one another's lives. Otherwise, we will become stiff-necked. We will be obstinate. We will be hard-hearted and hard-headed. We will become stubborn. And you know what? We will lose our sensitivity to the Spirit's work in us. Do you realize how dangerous that is? Is it possible in the past two years that, you know, because of everything that's been going on, that our hearts have been hardened? That's very dangerous. Well, why should we encourage one another? Why do other brethren matter to this brother? Hebrews 3.14 reads, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. He directs attention to their shared life in Christ. This is important because from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, the author points to Christ's supremacy, Christ's preeminence, Christ's superiority, Christ's greatness. And here is how we encourage one another, brethren. Uh, we don't need yung pepto, kaya mo yan, laban lang. It doesn't really work for, for believers. Eventually, that, that just loses its power. What you have is the power of commending Christ to each other, that we remind each other about who Christ is and what it is that Christ has done. We encourage one another towards enduring faithfulness to Christ. Brothers and sisters, how are we nurturing a deepening love for Jesus by refreshing our hearts with the truth of the gospel? Furthermore, how are we nurturing a deepening love in other brethren? How are we encouraging them to grow in their love for Jesus? How are we encouraging one another with the truths of the gospel? Hebrews 3.15 reads, While it is today, while it is said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me. Now, there's a lot to be said about the last part. We won't go into that this morning. But notice how he reminds them of the testimony of the scriptures. What the author actually does is he provides a biblical exposition of the Old Testament. And what he does is he applies it to the hearts of his readers. There are those who have opportunities to hear God's voice, to the faithful preaching of God's word. The question is, will they give heed to God's word or will they harden their hearts with unbelief and disobedience? 
What about you? How have you been responding to the preaching and teaching of God's Word? We praise the Lord that we are able to gather now in the way that we're gathering this morning. But as we sit under the preaching of God's Word, how have you been encouraged? How have you been strengthened? How has your faith grown? And how have you been encouraging and exhorting other brethren to respond to God's Word with faith in Christ, with obedience to Christ. This morning, we have the opportunity to fellowship with one another. I know it's going to be the first time at 100%. But I would like to encourage you to make use of this time as you interact with other brethren. Find out how you can encourage. Find out how you can exhort. How you can comfort and pray for a brother or sister. Make time to pray for each other. And pray also for the faithful preaching of God's Word that we all, by listening, unite the hearing of the Word with faith and with obedience. Pray that we will hear God's voice. Pray that we will not harden our hearts, but trust the Scriptures and obey the Lord. So keep your face masks on. And take the opportunity to be with the brethren to encourage one another. I know you're enjoying, and uh, so much so that I, even our worship leader forgot. Uh, he got lost within fellowship. So let's all rise, and let's just sing one more song before we uh, turn to our study this morning.
Lord, there are no words to express our profound gratitude for the grace that you've extended upon each one of us. And that is why we are here this morning as your children, as your people worshiping you because of your unbounding grace. And we thank you, Lord, that even this, uh, this morning as we worship, as we turn to study th your word, it is your grace that will help us so that we can appreciate your message and live your message out in our lives. We thank you, Father, because even as we sit in your presence, we know that your Holy Spirit will be ministering to us in grace. We entrust you, each one, in Christ's most precious name. Amen. You may all take your seats. Good morning. As you know, uh, last Sunday, I just came back from a month-long uh, pulpit duty break, which is mandated by the leaders. And typically, I do not take another break until three months later when I'm supposed to take my second uh, mandated pulpit break. Uh, but I just can't pass up the opportunity because I found out that... Uh, one of the CCM pastors, one of the CCM pastors with glowing, with a glowing reputation, <laughs> a bright countenance, <laughs> the light of many people up in their city has come down to visit his grandchildren. So I can't pass up that opportunity, so I asked him to be our preacher uh, this morning. Of course, he is not new to you, and the reason that he's here is because he owes me. He, he owes me about, well, about five more preachings uh, because of all the work I've done over the years, which you have not even paid for. <laughs> so now it's down to five. Okay, so uh, we are grateful that he's been convicted of God to pay up. May puso rin pala. So, but we are indeed uh, grateful that after two years, he is actually going to be our first guest speaker. Uh, so we, are, uh, we praise the Lord and we trust that uh, he has uh, uh, received from God a message for us this morning. So please welcome our preacher for the day, our beloved, most anointed <laughs> man from Baguio, Robbie Casas, Pastor Robbie. Good morning. Um, do bear with me if I adjust a bit um, with with this. Para ako nagbebenta ng ticket sa sinehan. And um, praise God. Uh, it, it it is such a blessing for me to be here and. How I wish you could see you from where I am. This is a sight that is so sweet to behold because I haven't seen this in, in more than two years, ever since the pandemic hit. I miss our church right now because we are also at basically 100% uh, gathering. And we have been meeting since June of 2020. But to see this... Uh, is really grace upon grace. And I would like to exhort you to take advantage of this because we don't know how long a window like this will be open to us. This is the worst time for us to become slack in our commitment to the Lord, in our devotion to Him. Especially if you look at all the many things that are happening in the world today, not just in our nation, this is the worst time to be far from God, the worst time to be backsliding and lukewarm in our love and devotion to Him. I always say this in our church in Guiding Light and encourage them in this quite so often. 
this is a time for us to fight for our faith and to fight for our devotion to God. There are still many churches today that have not gathered. And uh, I fear that it is because it's not so much anymore about fear of whatever virus there is, but um, there is this spirit of lethargy and uh, complacency that has come upon uh, many places in the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Kasi mas madali, hindi ba? Mas madali na hindi ka na magbihis, okay, pupunta ka na lang sa TV or computer, and then you have your service, and then you don't even have to travel. Guess what? You don't even have to brush your teeth, right? And, and, and yet, um, that never replaces what church is. And we miss out on that. We, we miss out on that, uh, on that fellowship that we have, um, just being here together, worshiping the Lord, you fellowshipping with each other, and together at the, seat of, at the feet of our Lord, listen to His Word. And so I just like to encourage those of you here in Higher Rock who have not really recommitted to come to service, I think you should begin to do that while it is yet day. Because this window will not be open as long as we hope it would be. Especially when you look at the things that are happening today. And so with that, please join me in a word of prayer. Oh Lord God, it is truly only by your grace that we are here today not only to be able to worship you in a way that we know you have accepted, Lord God, as worship from our devotion to you, imperfect as our worship is. But now, Lord, to sit at your feet, to look up to you as our Heavenly Father, who is now about to feed our souls, and not just instruct us in the way that we should go, but also to help us to know you more through the preaching of your truth. Father, we are humbled by this privilege because undeserving as we are, you had chosen us before the foundation of the world. And in the time of your choosing, you have drawn us to the Lord Jesus Christ and granted us faith and repentance to finally come to him for salvation. And here we are now. When most people in the world are rejecting you, rebelling against you, ignoring you, Lord, we have this blessed gift of being able to come into your presence and to feed upon your truth, to hear your voice in our hearts through the preaching of your word. Use thy servant and go beyond his weaknesses and grant your people understanding, I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. First off, Um, What I will be sharing with you today is not an exposition of a particular passage in the Bible. When Brother Kaloy asked me for my passage, I told him I have no specific passage that I will be expositing today. Because what I would like to share with you is part of a study that I'm doing on the sovereignty of God. Now, I, I know you've heard many, many preachings on the sovereignty of God But to be honest with you, uh, the sovereignty of God is among there in the top of my list of most favorite doctrines and truths in Scripture. And um, I personally can never have enough of it, and so that has brought me to do a study on the sovereignty of God. And the sovereignty of God really is one of the most encouraging of doctrines in the Bible. Especially when you consider the times that we are in. 
Because you begin to realize that really we are never at the mercy of men. We are never at the mercy of nature. We are always at the mercy of God, who is, by the way, not just our God, but our Father who is in heaven. So it is so encouraging. And uh, at the same time, um, having said that, to teach on the sovereignty of God and all of the other branches of doctrines that it would spill over to is a challenging task. It's not easy. It's not easy, especially for the reason that at some point when you begin to study the sovereignty of God, you will come across either one, passages in the Bible that seem to contradict it. And I would like to emphasize that, that seem to contradict it. Because the, the, the seeming contradiction really, when you think about it, is on our end. On our end. Because we have finite, sinful, very limited minds. And, and that is why um, it is difficult because you have to answer those contradictions. And at some points, you will come to that realization that the Bible does not really explain everything. And that's why studying it and teaching it is also among the humblest of duties for any preacher who would preach the truth of God. Because you have to come to that point where you have to realize that my understanding is so limited, I can only grasp it up to this point. The rest, I have to accept by faith. Simply because these truths seemingly contradict in contradiction to each other are all in Scripture. And there is a reason for why God had put them in Scripture. See, we cannot choose. The doctrines in the Bible are not, a, are not for the purposes of a um, multiple choice um, situation for us. It's in the Bible, then we better be familiar with everything that is in Scripture. If God didn't want us to know it, He wouldn't have put it in Scripture in the first place. And that is why it is also humbling. Because at some point you will have to say, Lord... I cannot completely reconcile this, but it is there, and so I just have to believe it. And that is why it is also challenging, because if we are not careful, and this is, I believe, the sin of many, even in the whole of church history, that when you try to put the infinite God within the box of our very finite, limited, sinful minds, you will end up doing either of two things. One, you would sacrifice one of the doctrines in Scripture in favor of one that is easier to grasp. Or two, which is worse, you will end up coming with a doctrine that is totally contrary to what the Bible teaches about God. That's how heresies are born. That's why throughout the history of the church, there's been a battle in the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ against teachings uh, in the past, which continue until today, that force the, the understanding that Jesus cannot have two natures. He cannot be fully man and fully God at the same time. Because they try to put the doctrine of those two natures of the Lord Jesus Christ within the confines of their very finite and limited minds. And so they end up bringing out a, a coming, uh, coming um, out with a heretical doctrine. One, on one side, they teach that Jesus is not God. He was just man. He, and then uh, on the other side, the teaching that says, no, he was God. He just appeared like a man. And so... Unfortunately, heresies like this have been propagated throughout the centuries. And that is why um, it is challenging, but it is also humbling. Because at some point, you will have to be able to say, Lord, I bow before your truth and I bow before your scripture. And uh, I acknowledge that I cannot completely comprehend you.
please do not think that the Bible contains everything about God. How can, how can the infinite one be written in the pages of such a limited book? What the Bible contains are the truths that God had, had deemed fit for us to know about Him and about His doctrines. The truths that would lead us to the, doc- or to the doctrines of saving grace and how we can get saved and be adopted as His children. Yun lang po. Ito po ang sapat. And so that's why there are many things in Scripture that the Scriptures simply state already presuming them without explanation to be true of God. And those things are what we must accept by faith. Without faith, you will struggle. And, and that is why what, uh, for Holy Week, I had decided to speak on the doctrine of the sovereignty of God over the cross. Over the cross. As I mentioned earlier, when you study the sovereignty of God, you will begin to see how it overflows to other doctrines. One of my most favorite also at the top of my list is the doctrine of divine election, our being chosen unto salvation before the foundation of the world. What an amazing, beautiful, powerful, life-changing, mind-shattering doctrine. I could never grow tired of it. And it has continued to transform me as a believer. But when you look at that doctrine, it is so deeply rooted also again in the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. So madami pung sangay po ito. Sovereignty of God over evil and sin. The sovereignty of God over adverse events and incidents uh, that we go through like for example in just the past two years all of us have been affected by this covid pandemic and we have experienced the devastation brought about by this crisis now there are many aspects to this that we don't have time to look at but really at some point some of us may have been hit by the disease Uh, Some may have been hit by it severely, and some of us may have experienced the loss of someone close to us, someone we love, someone we never expected to die at at such an age, and it has devastated us. And truth to tell, many have begun to question the goodness of God. And the grace of God because of things like these. Now, I want us to go back just further in recent history, back, way back to 2004, sometime in December of 2004, a magnitude 9.1 earthquake hit the Indian Ocean and that created a tsunami that killed more than 227,000 people along the coastline of the Indian Ocean. And that happened on December 26, right after Christmas. I remember seeing that news as we, were with, as we, had, as we had a family uh, reunion, family gathering in the house of my sister, and we saw that on TV. And it was right after Christmas. And I remember one of the questions that popped into my mind was simply this, Lord, why? Why right after Christmas? Then go back further, a little further earlier, to 2001, in September 9, when one of the most brazen terroristic events happened in New York City. And we remember that as the 9-11 disaster. And that terroristic activity has changed, had changed the world, had changed the history of military activities and directions, not just for the U.S., but for many nations. And then go back further still to 1990, July, 16 to be exact, when a 7.9 earthquake hit northern 
Luzon. And uh, it took the lives of some 3,500 people, I think. And that was the reason why we were sent to Baguio to establish work there, to see how we could help. And some of you probably here are from Baguio. How many here are from Baguio? Well, well, yeah, yeah, amen. How many of you had the privilege of enjoying that devastating calamity? You are there, right? And it, 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 it is unforgettable. I remember the story of someone, uh, someone in Baguio who had just um, built a beautiful house in, in the mountains overlooking a cliff. And the house was blessed in the first week of July. Two weeks later, in July 16, that person saw his house crumble and go down and be destroyed, that, go down that cliff in destruction. All his savings, dun linagay. Of course, we know of people who had lost loved ones. Go further, further, further back to World War II, and you know of Hitler and the Holocaust, which cost the lives of more than six million Jews. Then go back to the present time, just last year, 2021, when according to the Open Doors watch list, almost 4,800 Christians have been killed in persecution. And that's not even counting those who have, may have been killed in closed nations where you have no freedom to check on how the churches there are doing. And because of things like this, and I'm sure that you could add to this, how many times have we heard the question, if, if God was good and loving, how could He allow these terrible things to happen? Now, although I have sought to answer that question in many times in the past in, in all my preachings and teachings on the sovereignty of God and the holiness of God, we will not be answering that question because there is still a greater question to answer, especially in the light of our yearly celebration of Holy Week in our nation. And I've heard it asked more than once since I became a believer. How could a God who is supposedly loving allow his son to suffer and die in the way that he did. How? And so though, though this is not an exposition of a particular passage, I, I see this at some point also possibly uh, an apologetic on this topic on the sovereignty of God, especially towards the character or the attribute of God's sovereignty and His holiness and His goodness. How? How could a God who is supposedly loving allow His one and only Son to suffer and die in the way that He did? Actually, this is an almost predictable way that many who are not familiar with the gospel of salvation, many who have not yet had a saving relationship with Christ would think it's almost predictable. In fact, there are many believers, unbelievers rather, who hide behind questions like this to try to excuse themselves from coming to Christ in saving faith and repentance. Madalas nila gamitin ito. But let me just say this. In fact, the whole truth about Jesus' suffering and death is worse than what most people think including even believers. Why do I say worse? Because, dear friends, God did not just allow His beloved Son to suffer and die. He actually ordained that He did. I'd like to repeat that. God did not just allow His beloved Son, Jesus, to suffer and die. He actually ordained that He did And please do bear with me because I'd like to just deal with those two words. Those two words are very different. The word allow and the word ordain. They're very, very different. We're more comfortable with the word allow. Why did God allow this? And we use that more often than we realize when it comes to God. Now, I have no problems with that. 
But when you begin to study the sovereignty of God, you will begin to see the difference. You see, to allow, I believe, is very passive. God sees something coming, that, and then he looks at it, and he says, oh, that, that's good, I'll allow it. On the other hand, you will see something coming on the other side and say, oh, I don't like that, I won't allow it. It's very passive. You begin to ask the question, but where did those things come from anyway? It's very different from the truth of God ordaining things. God did not just allow these things, He actually ordained these things. Magkaiba. We can possibly even accept the fact that God had allowed many of our loved ones to have been severely affected by COVID, for example. But to say that God ordained it, well, that's something different. And many Christians would even raise their eyebrows with regard to that. I remember just fairly recently reading an article that was sent to me. Uh, this man was trying to explain sin. And he came up with this statement in the middle of that article. And he said, God did not allow sin. It was man who allowed sin. Now, I have a problem with that. Because if God did not allow sin and sin was able to sneak in, doesn't that make sin just as powerful, if not more powerful, than God? Right? But sometimes Christians are embarrassed by the doctrine of God's absolute, perfect, and complete sovereignty. And so they come up with statements like that. Now before I continue, I would just like to say that this one message, in this one message, we will just barely scratch the, sur the surface of this indescribably lofty doctrine of Scripture. And, and truth to tell, the deeper we look into the truth of God's sovereignty, the more we will be confronted by the realm of mystery. What do I mean by that? There will be many things our finite and sin-stricken minds will be incapable of understanding, will be incapable of even fully reconciling. Mahirapan ho talaga tayo. And we just have to humbly accept that truth and that fact. Some truth, even seemingly contradictory ones, we will just have to accept by faith simply because the Bible teaches them. Sabi kasi ng Bible eh. And that's why I love, I love Calvinism, or the doctrines of Calvinism, because Calvinism is not ashamed to say, I don't know. That is where Arminianism fails. Because at some point, argue long enough with an Arminian, and you will see that he will begin to depart from Scripture and begin to rely on his own rational logic. The Calvinists will just keep going back to the Bible and say, Bakit ganyan kung ganito? If he's arguing with an Arminian and he's not ashamed to say, I don't know. E nasa Bible yan eh. Not the Arminian. And so, I would like to begin first with this unabashed declaration. And what is that declaration or declarations? First, in God's absolute and complete sovereignty, whatever Whatever he allows, he had first ordained. I'd like to repeat that. In God's absolute and complete sovereignty, whatever he allows, he had first ordained. He would never allow something that he had not ordained. Even calamities, even events that have killed many, I have had to grapple for a while with passages like Isaiah 47, 45, verse 7, where, where God Himself had said that, yes, I cause the well being and I create calamity. Calamity comes from His hand. 
And, and that's why sometimes I find it almost amusing when typhoons or major uh, calamities threaten a particular nation. And there are Christians, I remember many, many years ago when there was this huge hurricane that was about to hit the eastern coast of the U.S. And there were several Christians who stood at the coast maybe a day before it was supposed to hit, and they were rebuking the hurricane. What do you do with passages like Isaiah 45 when you begin to actually realize, wait, if that's a calamity, and then that comes from the hand of God. And I've begun to see that when God allows a calamity or ordains a calamity to come, it is always a form of some sort of judgment. And so you rebuke this calamity, you're actually rebuking the hand of God. In God's absolute and complete sovereignty, whatever He allows, He had first ordained. And this applies to everything in the whole of creation. Everything. From the movements of the smallest particles in creation, to the Colossal cosmic events that you will find in the largest galaxies in the universe. God, His sovereignty applies to everything in His whole creation. Nothing, nothing exists and moves outside of His divine sovereignty. Why? Because He is the creator of all things. Amen, Puba. Nothing exists and moves outside of His divine sovereignty because He is the creator of all things. Scripture categorically tells us this in John chapter 1, verse 3. Please turn your Bibles there in referring to the second person of the Godhead, the Lord Jesus Christ. In John 1, 3, we would read, All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. God is therefore absolutely sovereign over all things and over all events in the whole of creation, from the greatest good to the worst evil. And that is where we many times have a problem, especially as believers. And that's why I believe there are many who are afraid to truly delve deeply into the doctrine of God's sovereignty and preach that in church. Because you will have to be confronted with the truth that God is absolutely sovereign over all things and all events in the whole of creation from not just the greatest good, but to the worst evil. Because they begin now to argue, can that even be true? Because if he has ordained evil, then doesn't that make him evil? Doesn't that make him the source of evil? But you see, you cannot just touch that doctrine in isolation because God is perfectly holy on one side and absolutely righteous, though He has decreed that evil to come into His creation, He is not the source of it. Is that, isn't that double talk, Pastor? No. Because he had, he had still decreed it. He is not the source of it because he is absolutely and holy and perfectly righteous. He could not be the source of it. But, but whatever evil he has decreed, these are to ultimately serve his holy and perfect purposes. I'd like to stress that. Whatever evil he has decreed. You see, unfortunately, the Bible does not give us a full explanation of the source of evil. It doesn't. But whatever evil God has decreed, 
These are to ultimately serve His holy and perfect purposes. And at this point, friends, we now skirt the limits of what our finite, created, and fallen minds can grasp. Kaya minsan nakakatakot hawakan nito. Wow, God decreeing evil. What kind of God is that? That's contrary to my understanding that He is holy, that He is loving. Now, for our purposes today, we will not discuss God's sovereignty over evil and sin in, in general. But we will take a glimpse at the doctrine of God's sovereignty over the cross in particular. Now, at first glance, when you go back through Scripture and look at the accounts of what Christ suffered, the indignities and the tortures that Christ had gone through, had suffered, appeared to have been inflicted by his enemies with determined intention and desire. And let me just make this very clear. Truly, all that his enemies had done to him were nothing less than willful. Nothing less than willful. Lahat ng ginawa ng kaaway ni Kristo sa kanya were nothing less than willful. And these are clear from accounts of Scripture. Let's take a quick look at some of them. For example, if you turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2, verse 16, there you will see Herod the Great decreeing decreeing the genocide of male babies aged two and younger in his determination to kill the infant Jesus. He decreed it. And that decree was driven, was driven by his jealousy of the prophecy about a coming king. So even before Jesus was born, his enemies were already opposing him. Now turn with me to John 5 verse 18. When you look at the Gospel of John, there you will see many times that the Jewish leaders sought to kill Jesus because of his claims and his actions. And one example is in John 5:18. And let's read that. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. In John 8 and John 10, you will see Accounts like that. In Luke 4, you will see accounts like that. A very intentional, a very deliberate desire to kill Christ. Jump to John 11, a very familiar chapter, I'm sure. After Jesus raised Lazarus in John 11, look at verse 53. The Jewish leaders were so threatened by him that, read verse 53, that from that day on, they planned, they planned together to kill him. Now that's pretty intentional if you ask me. They planned. At different points in the accounts of the Gospels, Jesus stood before Annas, Caiaphas, Pilate, Herod, all of whom mocked and or tortured him. In John 19, please turn with me to John 19. Pilate commanded, commanded that Jesus be flogged in verse 1. He commanded it. And then in the next two verses, his soldiers later scorned and beat him. I want you to read those two verses in John 19, verses 2 and 3. And there you will see that the, that the soldiers even enjoyed what they were doing to the Lord. A few verses later, in verses 6 to 7, again, 
the Jewish leaders in this time with the people cried out for his crucifixion. Crucify him. There was no reluctance in that. And then finally in verse 18, they crucified him. Now, brethren, in all these instances, we see all these people acting in their own volition. They all acted in their own volition. None of them moved as though there was some unseen force that was coercing them against their will to do what they did. No unseen force forcing them. They did all this according to their own volition. And that is why the cross was the worst evil ever willfully committed by men. I'd like to repeat that. That is why the cross was the worst evil ever willfully committed by men. That is the worst. Number one, top of the list, worst evil. There has never been a more undeserving, a more unjust death than that of the sinless Son of God. First of all, it was because he was sinless. And secondly, what did he do when he was here on earth, brethren? All he did was speak the truth. All he did was to teach wisely. Healed the sick. All he did was to reach out to the outcast and bring hope to the sinner. And for this, he was tragically and insufferably executed as an alleged criminal. They made it a point for Christ to be not only crucified, which was a crim criminal's death, but crucified with two criminals on his side. And that is why the full guilt of the murder of Christ was upon these men. The full guilt. And I believe by extension upon all men who had sinned against God. The full guilt. If man had not sinned, then there would be no Calvary. But because man had sinned, and that's, that is why there is Calvary. And so I'd like to establish that this fact. Man is fully responsible, culpable, guilty of what he did against Christ. And yet, beyond what mortal men could see, God was completely at work. Sovereignly fulfilling His divine plan that He had decreed from eternity past. Amen? I'd like to repeat that. Beyond what mortal men could see, mortal men during that time, and even mortal men like us, when we read those accounts, God was completely at work, sovereignly fulfilling His di divine plan that He had decreed from eternity past. In fact, Jesus Himself hinted at this during His last supper with His disciples. Please turn your Bibles with me to Luke 22, verse 22. Luke 22, verse 22. 
And in the first part of that verse, you will read, For indeed the Son of Man is going as it has been determined. As it has been determined. The word determined is the Greek word horizo, which literally means to mark out or to set a boundary. This is the word from which we get the English word horizon. When you are at the beach and you look further out into the sea, you will see that horizon that divides, from our view at least, the sea from from heaven or from the heavens. That is that word. But figuratively, it has, me, it has meant to appoint, to decree, to declare, to determine, to ordain. For indeed, the Son of Man is going as it has been ordained. In Acts chapter 2, please turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. After Jesus ascended and the Holy Spirit came upon the, upon the disciples, Peter in Acts chapter 2 addressed the crowd that gathered, who had earlier heard the disciples speak in their own native tongues, and they were amazed. And in that speech or preaching, Peter testified of Jesus saying, look at verse 23. This man, watch this, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. If there was one verse that makes this truth clear, this is one of those. Delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. The word predetermined there is also horizo. And foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Well, let me just say this. The foreknowledge of God is not God looking down the corridors of history... And moving and deciding according to what he sees will happen in history. That's not what it means. And then in the next chapter, please turn with me to Acts chapter 3. In his speech to the men at Solomon's portico after the healing, after the healing of the man lame from birth. Peter clearly charged these men who were listening to him for having delivered and disowned Christ in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. Look at that. That's towards verse 17. But then in, in verse 18, he added, But the things which God announced beforehand, announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Announced beforehand, he has thus fulfilled. Go to the next chapter in Acts chapter 4. After being arrested for proclaiming the risen Christ in Acts chapter 4, Peter and John were threatened by the Jewish leaders and then released. Later, upon returning to be with their companions, they prayed with their companions. I want you to look at verses 27 and 28 of Acts 4. In those verses, this is what they prayed. Verse 27, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you had anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. Verse 28, To do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. 
The word predestined is the Greek word prohorizo, which is very similar to horizo. It's just that the, a prefix pro was added to it. And so it means that it was, it literally means to limit in advance. And, and figuratively, it means to predetermine, to determine beforehand, to ordain beforehand, to predestinate. Now, friends, in, in all of these passages that we have looked at, from the full culpability of those who had killed Jesus and made him suffer, to the next set of passages where we had seen the sovereignty of God, two very important but seemingly contradictory truths we will see. Two very important but seemingly contradictory truths. First, First, Jesus was not deliberately or was not delivered up to suffer and die in spite of the plan of God, but actually according to the plan of God. Firstly, Jesus was not delivered up to suffer and die in spite of the plan of God, but according to it. Jesus' suffering and death was not something that happened outside of the original plan of God. He actually decreed it. And God predestined not only the death of Christ, but also everything that led up to it. Ulitin ko po yun. God predestined not only the death of Christ, but also everything that led, that led up to it. He sovereignly guided every circumstance and detail. I'm trying to build a picture here of God's very involved sovereignty. In what happened to Christ. That is the first truth. Jesus was not delivered up to suffer and die in spite of the plan of God, but actually according to it. The second truth is this. On the other hand, the enemies of God, the enemies of Christ, Herod, Pilate, the Jews and the Gentiles, did what they wanted to do. They did what they wanted to do, and that was to kill Jesus. Therefore, making them fully responsible and guilty for their most heinous sin. Ulitin ko po yung ikalawang katotohanan. All the enemies of Christ did what they wanted to do. Kill Jesus making them fully responsible and guilty for their most heinous sin. Of course, without their knowing it in all that they did, they were merely carrying out God's plan, decreed before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world. And here, brethren, we see the tension the tension that is always present in the Bible's teaching on the sovereignty of God. And what is that tension? On the one hand, you have the absolute, complete, perfect sovereignty of God over every person and every event. And then on the other hand, you have man's total and full responsibility for all his actions. There is that tension. Ano ba talaga doon? God so sovereignly directing everything? Or man making his own choices? Ano ba talaga doon? All of the above. Both. How can we reconcile it? We can't. Not on this side of eternity at least. We can't. 
And when you really think about it in the same way, God's sovereignty was at work even in our own eternal salvation, right? In His sovereignty, He chose to save us in Christ according to Ephesians 1.4, before the foundation of the world. He chose to save us in Christ before the foundation of the world. I love that. That is, that is the doctrine of divine election. That is one of those branches in the study of the sovereignty of God. God sovereign over salvation and, and judgment. And uh, I, I make this very clear because not, not very many, unfortunately, uh, praise God, Tayopo, sa CCM, by the grace of God, we are not afraid to teach these things all but, all but by the grace of God. But many churches, they, they're, they're, they're actually surprised to hear of these things. We know of people who have been Christians for long time and then when you begin to talk to them about divine election they say what is that it's a difficult teaching because it it tells us that god had chosen some to be saved while the rest would remain under judgment and it would lead people to sometimes say that's unfair but when you really think about this, this is not a matter of fairness. This is a matter of grace because all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and the penalty of sin is death. Therefore, all men deserve to die. It was just the grace of God that caused him to choose some to be saved. And if you're saved, you're one of them. And, and, and some people try to explain that away to excuse the sovereignty of God by saying that God looked down the corridors of time and He saw each and every one who would choose Him in history and therefore He chose them. It, itong si, itong si Milane. Pinili ako, kaya pipiliin ko siya. Itong BJ, pinili ako, kaya pipiliin ko siya. And that's how they explain that. Completely forgetting what the Lord said in John 15. Hey, you did not choose me. I chose you. And the reason you chose me is because I chose you. In 1 John 4, the Lord was clear when He said, You love because I first loved you. So in His sovereignty, He chose us unto salvation before the foundation of the world. And the sovereignty of God continues. At our appointed time, He drew us to Christ. John 6, 44, the Lord said, No one can come to me if the, unless the Father Himself draws Him. That's still the sovereignty of God. Hindi natin pwedeng sabihin sa langit, Lord, ligtas mo ka ha, kasi lumapit ako sa iyo. Christ will just answer us simply by saying, hey, it was my Father who drew you to me. And then in Ephesians chapter 2, there we would see that we had been given the gift of faith. And then in Acts 11 verse 18, there you will see that we had been granted repentance so that through these, we would be able to come to Christ in a saving way. Wala ko tayong pwedeng ipagmalaki eh. But, but, on the other hand, we are responsible for the following things. We are responsible, for example, to heed Christ's call to come to Him. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. We are responsible to confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised Him from the dead. Romans 10, 9. We are responsible to repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. Acts 26, verse 20. 
And then later on, as we are saved, we are responsible to live no longer for ourselves, but for Him who died and rose again on our behalf. 2 Corinthians 5.15 So here we see our responsibility as well. So ano ba talaga? Sa dalawang yan, pastor, answer both. Because both are taught in Scripture. And so what do we see here now? Going back to the cross. Going back to these two truths. In God's perfect wisdom and sovereignty. He brought forth from the worst evil ever committed. The murder of Jesus Christ on the cross. He brought forth the greatest good ever bestowed. The eternal salvation of fallen man and the ultimate glorification of the holy God of the universe. I'd like to repeat that. In God's perfect wisdom and sovereignty, though we cannot reconcile all of these truths perfectly or in the way that would make us feel comfortable, in God's perfect wisdom and sovereignty, He brought forth from the worst evil ever committed, which is the murder of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, the greatest good ever bestowed, the eternal salvation of fallen men and the ultimate glorification of the holy God of the universe. And friends, what comfort to know that the greatest evil done was in the absolute, perfect, and complete sovereignty of our God. Amen? What comfort. Satan was never in control. Evil men were never in control. Only God was. In what happened at Calvary and in everything that led up to it. Only God was. Now let me bring this home now to us as I begin to close. If that was the case, God in His sovereignty and wisdom able to bring out from the worst evil the greatest good how much more then will our God and Father bring forth from the present and lesser evils the ultimate good of those He had redeemed by the blood of Christ and the highest glory for His name. Amen? Ito po nakikita ko po ang application natin para sa ngayon. These lofty doctrines are intensely practical in their implications for us today. If God was able to bring out the greatest good from the worst evil that happened on Calvary, how much more then will our God and our Father bring forth from the present but lesser evils the ultimate good of those He had redeemed by the blood of Christ, that's you and me if we are in Christ, in the highest glory for His name. Think of all the evil things that men all over the world are doing, and they are really evil. Present Western culture is blatantly, blatantly rebelling against God. And and, and it's just so bad. But that is a lesser evil compared to what happened to the cross. So when you think of all of these present but lesser evils, God will bring out the ultimate good. And I say ultimate because some of us might actually suffer for the faith. Some of us might actually perish in some future calamity or whatever. And that doesn't mean that God forgot to, give, to bestow on us good. And that's why I say ultimate ultimate 
That's why the martyrs were able to die the way that they did, praying for their executioners, praying for their persecutors, worshiping God in, 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 as they were suffering, burning at the stake, because they were looking at the ultimate good that could never ever be taken away from us. Praise God. And brethren, in this truth, we must, during these dark times, all the more take comfort. All the more rejoice. All the more persevere in the faith. All the more be fervent in our service to God. All the more pursue holiness. All the more look for opportunities to share the gospel. And of course, all the more look forward with much excitement to the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because of the sovereignty of God, over the cross. I would not like us to simply look at that particular event and stay there. Yes, meditate on what Christ had gone through for you and for me, but look at the greater picture that was happening behind all of this. That's why in all of this, the counsel remains the same. No matter what we face in the coming months or years, we need to keep going back to the cross. We need to keep going back to the cross. The gospel is so amazing. It is so hopeful. It is so encouraging. It is so humbling. It is so worship-motivating. It's not just for the unsaved, it's for us who are saved as well. We need to keep going back to the cross precisely because of doctrines like this, the sovereignty of God over the cross. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you and I bless you, Lord, for your message today. I just pray, Father God, that you had used this to minister to my beloved brethren here in Higher Rock and I pray that you were ministering to them as you were ministering even to your servant, Lord God, as he was preaching this. Thank you. Thank you that you are our God. Thank you that you are our Lord and Savior. Thank you that you are our Redeemer. Thank you for our salvation. Thank you for our relationship with you in Christ Jesus. Thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we remember these truths, Lord, may we all the more live in a way that would bring pleasure to your heart and glory to your name. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you, Pastor Robbie. We have a few announcements. Uh, We have four, actually, but before that, we'd like to... uh, Acknowledge the presence of our first-timers. We have three who went to be uh, oriented. If you're still here, could you please uh, stand up? Jolene Villanueva, uh, Gigi Edu, and Josh Edu. Gigi and Josh I met earlier. So if you're here, please rise. Uh, There they are, Gigi and Josh. And Jolene is, where is Jolene? Somewhere. Oh, there, there. Okay. Thank you so much for attending Higher Rock. And we trust that the Lord will bless you through your week, uh, even as you consider the message and the experience that you heard from here. First announcement is in regard to our uh, prayer night uh, service. The Power of the Cross is the theme for this month of April. Uh, We invite you to join us every Wednesday, 7.30 to 8.30 via Zoom. Okay, so via Zoom lamang po yan. But we do encourage you, if you have prayer concerns, please write them down on pieces of paper and you may drop them in the prayer boxes right there in the back. Or 
You may email them your prayer concerns at hrcc.prayforme at gmail.com or you may even send an SMS to 917 We will pray for those concerns, so uh, feel free to share them with us. Me, do I know me? We've been promoting this. This is the Solo Cristo Single Adults Camp, which will be held during the Holy Week, April 14 to 16, at CCT Tagaytay. Okay, and as you know, that we, we have been uh, we have been promoting sponsor a camper, and the organizers of this camp said that if you sponsor a camper for a certain amount, you may win a laptop, a brand new laptop, a MacBook. So thank you for all you sponsors, and I'd like to announce the winner. I won it. <laughs> so I don't think that that's your gun. Uh, no, I did not win it. The winner is Brother Lawrence Trinidad. <laughs> so siya po yung nanalo. Uh, I think he, he, pay, he uh, gave about like 98 tickets. <laughs> so mas mahal po yung dinonate niya sa kanyang uh, reward. Anyway, uh, congratulations, Lawrence. The youth have a uh, the youth fellowship has a video, so please. Young man, do you really know the gospel? That's really the ultimate question that we really ask young men like you. How come you are still attracted to the latest video games rather than the cross of Christ? On April 15, Friday, we will be discussing and studying together what the Bible teaches about how to become a mature man. See you there. Well, first of all, election reminds us that salvation is a sovereign work of God from beginning to end. It solidifies the fact that we are saved by grace through faith. That means we can never do anything in order to save ourselves. However, 1 Peter 1 verse 10 tells us, to make our election sure. And when we do, we will never stumble. Okay, young black rod girl from Fortune, I'd say. I think you're cute. I like you. The Bible tells us in Titus chapter 2 from verse 3 to 5 that a woman is to be discreet, self-controlled, careful, and circumspect prudent, and inconspicuous. A woman without discretion draws attention to herself, but a discreet woman points to the gospel. She makes the truth of a scripture stand out instead of her own opinion on matters. Well, my mom and dad are Christians, that church ako, that in Sunday school, Christian school, I don't read your portions of the Bible, so I think okay na ako, Christian na Okay ka na? Yan lang mga pagdagalingin ang sabi mo, okay ka na, Christian ka na. Lumaki ka sa church, sa Sunday school ka, marami ka activity siguro in attendance sa church. Yan lang ba parents mo, Christian? Pero yun lang ba? Marami sinasabi ang Bible para makita talaga natin na ikaw ay isang Christian. Is your life anchored in the gospel? Is it really founded in the wisdom of scriptures? Do you really want to grow in Christ-likeness? Are you growing by the standards of scripture, not just by mere attendance? And there's so many other things that the Bible is saying, this is what a Christian really is. Hindi yung kasi lumaki na ako sa church. Yun mga yun at marami pang iba ang titignan natin from God's word pagdating ng retreat. Punta kayo.
So that's the teaser for the re Reboot Youth Retreat. While the solo Christ or the young adults are out there in Tagaytay, they will be having a retreat here April 14 to 16. Uh, so uh, uh, that's from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. That will not be an overnight thing, so uh, they will be going home at the end of the day. The last day for registration is uh, today, uh, yeah, April 10. Today is the last day for registration, so we'd like you to uh, consider, if you haven't done it yet, uh, sending your children or you, you youth uh, people would, may want to uh, join them for this youth retreat. Um, and then finally, final registration uh, request, final announcement is... Are we ready? The Badminton Challenge, May 3. Okay, so those of you who have been uh, cooped up for two and a half years uh, since the time that we had our last activity, you may want to join uh, the Badminton Challenge beginning May 3. Registration dates are from April 10, uh, are April 10, 17, and 24. So two three days lamang po ang registration. Um, they will need you to register as early as possible because they will need to uh, book the place and, and schedule the, the tournament itself. So this is just going to be a one-day tournament as I understand it. Uh, so from morning till uh, the following morning. Uh, they, you know, uh, from morning to late in the day, they will be playing the tournament. So please register uh, for the badminton challenge. That's all for we have for our, by way of announcement. Ferdy, will you please close us in song? Please rise.
indeed, O oh God, we are so thankful, Father, for you are indeed sovereign in our lives. And everything that we have comes from you. You are indeed to be honored and praised alone. All glory to you alone. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.